Chapter Five of Lorna Doone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Harris. Lorna Doone by R. D. Blackmore. Chapter Five: An Illegal Settlement. Good folk who dwell in a lawful land, if any such there be may, for want of exploration, judge our neighbourhood harshly unless the whole truth is set before them. In bar of such prejudice, many of us ask leave to explain how and why it was the robbers came to that head in the midst of us. We would rather not have had it so, God knows as well as anybody, but it grew upon us gently in the following manner. Only let all who read observe that here I enter many things which came to my knowledge in later years. In or about the year of our Lord, 1640, when all the troubles of England were swelling to an outburst, great estates in the North Country were suddenly confiscated, through some feud of families and strong influence at court, and the owners were turned upon the world, and might think themselves lucky to save their necks. These estates were in co-heirship, joint tenancy, I think they called it, although I know not the meaning, only so that if either tenant died, the other living, all would come to the live one in spite of any testament. One of the joint owners was Sir Ensor Doone, a gentleman of brisk intellect, and the other owner was his cousin, the Earl of Lorne and Dykemont. Lord Lorne was some years the elder of his cousin, Ensor Doone, and was making suit to gain severance of the cumbersome joint tenancy by any fair apportionment, when suddenly this blow fell on them by wiles and woman's meddling, and instead of dividing the land they were divided from it. The nobleman was still well-to-do, though crippled in his expenditure, but as for the cousin he was left a beggar, with many to beg from him. He thought that the other had wronged him, and that all the trouble of law befell through his unjust petition. Many friends advised him to make interest at court, for having done no harm whatever, and being a good Catholic, which Lord Lorne was not, he would be sure to find hearing there, and probably some favour. But he, like a very hot-brained man, although he had long been married to the daughter of his cousin, whom he liked none the more for that, would have nothing to say to any attempt at making a patch of it, but drove away with his wife and sons, and the relics of his money, swearing hard at everybody. In this way he may have been quite wrong, probably, perhaps he was so, but I am not convinced at all but what most of us would have done the same. Some say that, in the bitterness of that wrong and outrage, he slew a gentleman of the court, whom he supposed to have borne a hand in the plundering of his fortunes. Others say that he bearded King Charles I himself, in a manner beyond forgiveness. One thing, at any rate, is sure. Sir Ensor was attainted, and made a felon outlaw, through some violent deed ensuing upon his dispossession. He had searched in many quarters for somebody to help him, and with good warrant for hoping it, inasmuch as he, in lucky days, had been open-handed and cousinly to all who begged advice of him but now all these provided him with plenty of good advice, it, it, indeed, and great assurance of feeling, but not a movement of leg or lip or purse-string in his favour. All good people, of either persuasion, royalty or commonality, knowing his kitchen range to be cold, no longer would play turnspit, and this, it may be, seared his heart more than the loss of land and fame. In great despair at last he resolved to settle in some outlandish part, where none could be found to know him, and so, in an evil day for us, he came to the west of England. Not that our part of the world is at all outlandish, according to my view of it, for I never found a better one, but that it was known to be rugged and large and desolate. And here, when he had discovered a place which seemed almost to be made for him, so withdrawn, so self-defended, and uneasy of access, some of the country folk around brought him little offerings, a side of bacon, a keg of cider, hung mutton, or a brisket of venison, so that for a while he was very honest. 
But when the newness of his coming began to wear away, and our good folk were apt to think that even a gentleman ought to work or pay other men for doing it, and many farmers were grown weary of manners without discourse to them, and all cried out to one another how unfair it was that owning such a fertile valley young men would not spade or plough by reason of noble lineage, then the young dunes growing up took things they would not ask for. And here let me, as a solid man, owner of five hundred acres, whether fenced or otherwise, and that is my own business, churchwarden also of this parish, until I go to the churchyard, and proud to be called the parson's friend, for a better man I never knew with tobacco and strong waters, nor one who could read the lessons so well, and he has been at Blundell's, too. Once for all let me declare that I am a thorough-going church and state man, and royalist, without any mistake about it. And this I lay down, because some people, judging a sausage by the skin, may take in evil part my little glosses of style and glibness, and the mottled nature of my remarks and cracks now and then on the frying-pan. I assure them that I am good inside, and not a bit of rue in me, only queer knots, as of marjoram, and a stupid manner of bursting. There was not more than a dozen of them, counting a few retainers who still held by Sir, Sir Ensor, but soon they grew and multiplied in a manner surprising to think of. Whether it was the venison, which we call a strengthening victual, or whether it was the Exmoor mutton, or the keen soft air of the moorlands, anyhow the dunes increased much faster than their honesty. At first they had brought some ladies with them, of good repute with charity, and then, as time went on, they added to their stock by carrying. They carried off many good farmers' daughters, who were sadly displeased at first, but took to them kindly after a while, and made a new home in their babies. For women, as it seems to me, like strong men more than weak ones, feeling that they need some staunchness, something to hold fast by. And of all the men in our country, although we are of a thick-set breed, you scarce could find one in three score fit to be placed among the dunes, without looking no more than a tailor. Like enough we could meet them man for man, if we chose all around the crown and the skirts of Exmoor, and show them what a cross buttock means, because we are so stuggy. But in regard of stature, comeliness, and bearing, no woman would look twice at us. Not but what I myself, John Ridd, and one or two I know of, but it becomes me best not to talk of that, although my hair is gray. Perhaps their den might well have been stormed, and themselves driven out of the forest, if honest people had only agreed to begin with them at once when they first took to plundering. But having respect for their good birth, and pity for their misfortunes, and perhaps a little admiration at the justice of God, that robbed men now were robbers, the squires and farmers and shepherds at first did nothing more than grumble gently, or even make a laugh of it, each in the case of others. After a while they found the matter gone too far for laughter, as violence and deadly outrage stained the hand of robbery, until every woman clutched her child, and every man turned pale at the very name of Dune. For the sons and grandsons of Sir Ensor grew up in foul liberty, and haughtiness, and hatred, to utter scorn of God and man, and brutality towards dumb animals. There was only one good thing about them, if indeed it were good, to wit, their faith to one another, and truth to their wild irie. But this only made them feared the more, so certain was the revenge they wreaked upon any who dared to strike a dune. One night, some ten years ere I was born, when they were sacking a rich man's house not very far from Minehead, a shot was fired at them in the dark, of which they took little notice, and only one of them knew that any harm was done. But when they were well on the homeward road, not having slain either man or woman, or even burned a house down, one of their number fell from his saddle, and died without so much as a groan. The youth had been struck, but would not complain, and perhaps took little heed of the wound, while he was bleeding inwardly. His brothers and cousins laid him softly on a bank of whortleberries, and just rode back to the lonely hamlet where he had taken his death wound. No man nor woman was left in the morning, nor house for any to dwell in. 
only a child with its reason gone. This vile deed was done, beyond all doubt. This affair made prudent people find more reason to let them alone than to meddle with them, and now they had so entrenched themselves, and waxed so strong in number, that nothing less than a troop of soldiers could wisely enter their premises, and even so it might turn out ill, as perchance we shall see by and by. For not to mention the strength of the place, which I shall describe in its proper order when I come to visit it, there was not one among them but was a mighty man, straight and tall, and wide, and fit to lift four hundred weight. If son or grandson of old Doon, or one of the northern retainers, failed at the age of twenty, while standing on his naked feet, to touch with his forehead the lintel of Sir Ensor's door, and to fill the door-frame with his shoulders from side-post even to side-post, he was led away to the narrow pass which made their valley so desperate, and thrust from the crown with ignominy, to get his own living honestly. Now the measure of that doorway is, or rather was, I ought to say, six feet and one inch lengthwise, and two feet all but two inches taken crossways in the clear. Yet I not only have heard, but know, being so closely mixed with them, that no descendant of old Sir Ensor, neither relative of his, except indeed the counsellor who was kept by them for his wisdom, and no more than two of their following ever failed of that test, and relapsed to the difficult ways of honesty. Not that I think anything great of a standard the like of that, for if they had set me in that door-frame at the age of twenty, it is like enough that I should have walked away with it on my shoulders, though I was not come to my full strength then. Only I am speaking now of the average size of our neighborhood, and the dunes were far beyond that. Moreover, they were taught to shoot with a heavy carbine so delicately and wisely, that even a boy could pass a ball through a rabbit's head at the distance of fourscore yards. Some people may think naught of this, being in practice with longer shots from the tongue than from the shoulder. Nevertheless, to do as above is, to my ignorance, very good work, if you can be sure to do it. Not one word do I believe of Robin Hood splitting peeled wands at seven score yards and such like. Whoever wrote such stories knew not how slippery a peeled wand is, even if one could hit it, and how it gives to the onset. Now let him stick one in the ground, and take his bow and arrow at it, ten yards away, or even five. Now after all this which I have written, and all the rest which a reader will see, being quicker of mind than I am, who leave more than half behind me, like a man sowing wheat, with his dinner laid in the ditch too near his dog, it is much but what you will understand the dunes far better than I did, or do, do even to this moment and therefore none will doubt when I tell them that our good justiciaries feared to make an ado, or hold any public inquiry about my dear father's death. They would all have had to ride home that night, and who could say what might betide them? Least said, soonest mended, because less chance of breaking. So we buried him quietly, all except my mother, indeed, for she could not keep silence, in the sloping little churchyard of Orr as meek a place as need be, with the Lynn Brook down below it. There is not much of company there for anybody's tombstone, because the parish spreads so far in woods and moors without dwelling-house. If we bury one man in three years, or even a woman or child, we talk about it for three months, and say it must be our turn next, and scarcely grow accustomed to it until another goes. Annie was not allowed to come, because she cried so terribly, but she ran to the window and saw it all, mooing there like a little calf, so frightened and so left alone. As for Eliza, she came with me, one on each side of mother, and not a tear was in her eyes, but sudden starts of wonder, and a new thing to be looked at unwillingly, yet curiously. Poor little thing! She was very clever, the only one of our family, thank God for the same but none the more for that guessed she what it is to lose a father. End of chapter 5 Recording by Michelle Harris